So listen to this. The year was 1986. Maradona had just carried Argentina to the World Cup title and alongside him was Bruno Passarelli, a journalist who was documenting the first months of his life following that earth-shattering performance. As they walked into the Napoli training grounds for the first time since the tournament, the fans lost their minds and chanted over and over again, Maradona, Maradona, he is better than Pele. But somehow, Diego seemed distant, which led Passarelli to question what was wrong. And that's when Maradona spoke out the words that cemented one of the biggest fairy tales, one of the biggest mysteries in the history of the sport. These fans are great, but what they don't know is that there is a player even better than Pele and I. He is Jorge González, El Mágico. He's playing for Cádiz. Phenomenal. Passarelli stared at him for a second and then asked who that man was. However, Maradona didn't bother putting it into words. He knew those never did him justice. So instead, he said, go and find out, you ignorant man. If you're a huge football fan, you've probably seen that name before, Mágico. You see, right now, if you visit the city of Pachuca in Mexico, you will find this huge building shaped like a football. They call it the Hall of Fame. If you go there, you will see statues of Maradona, Pelé, Puskas, Ronaldo, Zidane, Beckenbauer, Platini, only the best of the best. But among those familiar faces and names, you will again find an odd one. Jorge El Mágico González. As I said, it has this way of popping up over and over again. Valderrama said he was convinced Mágico was an extraterrestrial. Manolin Bueno said he was so good, he made it seem like Maradona was playing with a limp. And even more impressive, at one point, he was the only living football player to have a stadium named after him. He's become known as the player who could have been the best, but did not want to. The one who wanted to be forgotten. Yet his face seems to be permanently burnt into the memory of those who saw him play. Even a decade after his retirement, people spot him in his home country of El Salvador. They claim that he's become a taxi driver. That once they hit him with a question, Are you El Mágico? That he simply says, No, magicians do magic. I drive a taxi. But this leaves us with a question. Where did everything go wrong? Well, it was Maradona's fault, actually, kind of. In 1984, the two were both playing for Barcelona side by side. But if they were trouble on the pitch, they were even worse off of it. And at one point, the team was staying at this hotel in California and Maradona decided to hit the fire alarm in the middle of the night as a prank. And somehow, it was Mágico who ended up getting punished for that whole situation. But... We'll get there, because first, I have to explain how we even got to Barcelona. You see, if you're born in El Salvador, your chances of making it to European football are next to none. I literally can't think of any other player, but Mágico was just different. At 16, he was already making his debut, and before he had even turned 18, he was already moving to Deportivo FAS for 60,000 colones, which was absurd at the time, especially for a teenager. But thankfully for them, it worked out incredibly well. I mean, FAS was a great club, they had four league titles to their name, but the last of them had been 16 years before his arrival, and then, well, then they won it four times in five years, and that wasn't even it. In his second year at the club, he led them to the CONCACAF Champions Cup title. They were named the best team in all of Central and North America. In fact, they almost went a step further, drawing the first leg of the Inter-American Cup against Olympia, the Libertadores champions. At that point, everyone in the country was already convinced he was some kind of wizard, and they didn't even know what was coming the next year. In 1980, he joined El Salvador for the CONCACAF Championship qualification and somehow managed to get through the whole campaign with only one defeat, finishing in second place, topping the goal scorer's table, even outscoring Hugo Sanchez with five goals in seven matches. But wait, that still wasn't all of it. The year after that, once they were actually in the championship itself, they knew that if they finished top two they would make it to the World Cup since the whole tournament also doubled as a sort of qualifying stage. But just as everyone assumed the other countries would be fighting for that second place spot since, according to everyone, Mexico always won, they faced him, and Mágico pulled off one of the most absurd runs you'll ever see, and only 8 minutes from the end of the match, they pulled off the impossible. They beat Mexico for the first time in 26 years. In fact, it was around this time that a few of Mágico's clips were shown to the president of Valladolid, and he literally said, I was almost scared watching him. I had not seen a wonder like that since the times of Pele. 
Once the tournament was over, El Salvador was ahead of Mexico by just one point in second place. For only the second time in history, El Salvador would be at the World Cup. All thanks to that moment of genius. Right then and there, according to everyone in the country, Mágico was like a saint. And then, with each friendly that led up to the World Cup, things only got crazier. At one point, they faced PSG, as weird as it may sound, and they beat them 3-1, to one, with Mágico playing so so well that a journalist described it by saying, might be the best performance I've ever seen. Every time he dashed towards goal, it was like he was going by car while the others followed him on foot. By the end, the Parisians tried everything to sign him, but once it was all done, he just never showed up to sign the contract. Years later, when they asked about it, he claimed he didn't like the traffic, didn't like the call, didn't like the language, and above all, didn't like the French. Regardless, add to this a stunning performance versus Honduras only two months before the World Cup, where El Mágico assisted the first and scored two free kicks, one of them in the 89th minute to go in front 3-2, and as they went into the tournament, the whole country seemed convinced that somehow, Mágico alone would be enough to make them stand out. But instead, what awaited them was the most bitter and terrible night in memory. Right on their first match, El Salvador was defeated 10-1, to the biggest defeat in the history of the World Cup. They tried to justify themselves, claiming they had been unable to train the day before since their equipment had been stolen, which was actually even confirmed by FIFA, but regardless, it was a huge shame. The only positive thing was that, believe it or not, Michael was still great. In fact, I've seen some claims that some newspapers even named him man of the match. As much as that sounds impossible, I mean, go watch it. He was tireless, he kept going at them over and over again, and it did work once. It was thanks to one of his incredible runs that El Salvador scored where is still to this day their only ever goal at a World Cup. I mean, several newspapers even named him as one of the best in the tournament despite going out after three consecutive defeats, and in the aftermath of it all, he was flooded with transfer offers like never before, so oddly enough, it adds up. He himself said that the tournament had been ugly, but beautiful. Among all the chaos, he still managed to shine. Atletico, Fiorentina, Atalanta, even PSG took another jab at his signing and there were rumors of Inter doing the rounds, teams all across Europe tried, but they all failed. He had an excuse not to sign for any of them. Italy was too humid, when it came to England he said he couldn't ever live on an island, and Germany, well, he refused to even talk about them. By the end, he had signed for Cadiz, in the Spanish second tier. Why? It's one of the hottest places in Europe and they love flamenco. That's it. And even there, he only showed up for his supposed presentation 20 days late after the club had to get the police to go look for him. Turns out, he was all the way out in Madrid with a friend, just going from one bar to the other. And this behavior wouldn't stop here. Once there, he was always out and about, dancing and drinking, wandering through the streets, talking to anyone who came his way, and then, of course, when it came to training, he was always late, and when he did show up, he fell asleep in the locker room. But believe it or not, his teammates and manager kinda loved him. After all, they could never complain about his performances, and he was extremely charismatic, so they took him in like a sort of mascot, always trying to find funny ways to get him to wake up early. Once the manager bought him this obnoxious Donald the Duck clock that would quack at him until he woke up. On another occasion, they literally sent a band to his house, just like in the movies, but regardless, he would always have these funny one-liners. If the coach asked him to make more runs, he would say that running is for cowards. If he told him he had to put in more effort in the area, he would tell him that the head is for thinking, not for hitting a ball. Even aside from that, they just loved him. Whenever someone asked for his autograph, he would spend like two minutes on it, always trying to make every single one special. He also loved talking to the homeless, he would help them with whatever they needed. Once one of his teammates gave him one of his expensive jackets, because Mahiko would always arrive to club dinners and meetings wearing a t-shirt and shorts, but only a few days later, his teammate found some homeless guy sleeping on the street with his jacket on. Obviously, there was much more to his life than football. As he said it himself, I don't treat football like a career. I just play for fun. But don't get it wrong, what he did on the pitch was still by far the primary excuse for his actions. Though no one denied that he was often very lazy, it was guaranteed that every game there would be a magic moment that would completely change the course of that match. It was undeniable that he was the most important player on the team. 
Not only did he get them promoted to La Liga for only the third time in their history right on his debut season, but once there, he pulled off 14 league goals, which was almost twice as many as any other player in the history of the club, and even allowed him to reach the podium of the league's goal-scoring table. Which was made even more special by the fact that, well, he was a big game player. He literally scored twice in his first ever match against Real Madrid with two incredible runs that almost made it seem like the other players were stuck to the ground, and as incredible as it may seem, his performances against Barcelona were were even better, with Mahiko again scoring two goals, but supposedly not only not making Maradona but pulling off the kind of run even Diego would have been jealous of. And as you've probably already realized, that's how he found himself touring with Barcelona. By the end of the season, even if Cadiz had been relegated regardless, I mean, to be fair that 16th place was their best finish ever, but yeah, no matter what happened, after what he had done to Barcelona they couldn't resist giving him a chance, but they also weren't willing to take a gamble on such an unpredictable character, so they used their tour as a sort of trial. As long as he played well and didn't get in trouble, soon he'd be lining up alongside Maradona week in, week out. But as much as the fans claimed that watching them play together was like having two Maradonas on the pitch at the same time, I mean, Diego himself said that in training they used to try to imitate him and he just couldn't figure out how to pull off some of his tricks. Well, you already know things didn't go well. On that famous night in the hotel, Maradona supposedly pulled the fire alarm as a prank, but while every single player and guest in the building ran down immediately thinking there was actually a fire, Mahiko claims that he somehow knew it was Maradona, so he just never came down. Meanwhile, Menotti, the coach, began a head count and quickly noticed he was missing, which led him to force his way past security, going up two floors, knocking on Mahiko's door, only to eventually find him passed out in bed with two girls laying next to him. In fact, according to one of his biographies, when Menotti inquired him over how he managed to get them there with all the security around, he replied, They do say I'm a wizard. <laughs> Regardless, if Menotti was already not the biggest fan of this transfer, after this, there was no doubt in his mind that Mahiko was going back to Cadiz. But I can't stop thinking that, had Maradona not touched that alarm, maybe he and Mahiko would have had at least one season together. But no matter what, Mahiko wasn't done with Barcelona. As the story goes, before the season even started, Barcelona came down to Cadiz for the Ramon Caranza Cup, and once they met in the semi-finals, Barcelona was already 3-0 up at halftime. However, it was only in the second half that Mágico came on, and now it was time for revenge. Two goals and two assists, and just like that, the game had been turned on its head. It became one of the most infamous stories in Spanish football, but I'm sorry to inform you, this one is completely fake. Though that match did happen, it wasn't a semi-final, Mahiko didn't even start on the bench and he didn't score or assist either. Yeah, sorry, I just had to mention the legend, however, he did end up on the bench shortly after that but it was only because the new coach Benito Joanet could not stand him and though the fans put up one banner after the other with the funniest of all famously reading, Vero doesn't like Mahiko, doesn't even like his own mother, it didn't matter. By January he was already leaving to Valladolid, who finally got their men four years after they had first scouted them, but unfortunately, Mahiko did not get along at his new club. He seemed to constantly miss the city and the people of Cadiz, and after only nine matches, he was threatened by the first coach who told him that he had 15 days to get his game in order or he'd be sent away. So, before that even happened, he disappeared. Like, literally. Not even he knows exactly what he did, just that months later, he woke up in Los Angeles and with some vague memories of having been in Tijuana. It was like the Hangover movies, you know? Regardless, having now hit absolute rock bottom, he began training with Atletico Marte in El Salvador, trying to get in shape, and in what seemed like a miracle, the manager Carlos Jorado just happened to be friends with Manolo Carlo, precisely the new manager of Cadiz. And after a lot of negotiation, Mágico came back to the city of his heart, under one condition, or I guess dozens of them. Not only did they force him to visit a psychologist every week or to have a club employee get him from his house every morning, but they added all kinds of clauses, fines and fees to his contract trying to get him to settle down, but yet, it never happened. Instead, according to many sources, over the next few years, they just ended up pretty much not paying him because every month, the total amount in fines would be higher than his wages and, although that wasn't the solution they had planned, it kinda worked. He kept scoring magical goals at a rate none of his teammates could match and, since they weren't even paying him, why send him away? I mean, by 87 he led them to what is to this day their best ever league campaign. Some clubs like Atalanta even gave another go at trying to sign him, but obviously it never went through, and by 89 everyone probably thought he'd retire, but instead 
It all took a really dark turn when, out of nowhere, Jorge was sentenced to six months in jail for, you know, doing that awful thing I can't mention to a young woman in the house of one of his teammates. Trust me, it's hard to find the details if you don't speak Spanish, but I did. And it was pretty gruesome. And though the club would strangely decide to keep him around, soon after he himself decided to flee to El Salvador, where he would play until he was 41 before retiring and becoming a taxi driver. This is what you call a downfall. Crazy to think that everyone thought he was such a nice guy.